This is the story of riding my bike from Jasper, Alberta, Canada to Antelope Wells, New Mexico, along the Great Divide. In episode four, Carl and I rode through the remainder of Colorado. I took a rest day in Salida, I got to ride with Eric, who sold me my bike, and I climbed the highest pass on the route. We left off with me leaving Carl and the route to head to Chama, New Mexico for some medicine and some rest. In this episode, I recover from illness, then return to the trail for the final ride from Abiquiu to Antelope Wells, New Mexico. When I got to Chama, I found a motel after about three tries and I just went to the grocery store, got some medicine, got some easy foods and turned in for the night. Um, the next morning I was feeling even worse and I wasn't able to sleep again that night and I was really tired and I didn't have much of an appetite and I had a really, really bad sore throat. So I was starting to get pretty concerned that maybe I should see a doctor. But since it was Labor Day, all of the clinics, the local clinics were closed. I looked into it and there were a couple of hospitals within two hours away and I, I tried to get a taxi that would take me there or um, any sort of ride service. Nothing was available. So at this point, I was pretty scared and I thought, oh, I have a friend who's a nurse, my friend Carrie, who lives in Albuquerque. Um, so maybe she'll know what to do. So I gave Carrie a call and just immediately she said, I'll come get you. You can recover at our house. <laughs> um, I can't even tell you just the relief that I felt. I almost cried um, and just how brave that she was that she was willing to do that for me. So I would spend the next days in Albuquerque. Carrie and Greg's home just outside of Albuquerque was a great place to recover. They're both bike people, so of course Elise was allowed to come inside. I mostly slept for the first two days, fighting a sore throat and crap in my lungs. When I started to feel better, Greg took me to BikeWorks ABQ to help me get better gearing on my bike. We replaced my front chain ring with a 40 tooth and my rear with an 11 speed 46 tooth cassette. This would greatly help me with my climbing moving forward. By the fourth day, I'd recovered enough that Carrie thought I should test out how I would feel at higher elevation. She drove me up to Sandia Peak, which is above 10,000 feet. It's a beautiful place with incredible views and structures built by workers of the Civilian Conservation Corps in the 1930. On my last day, Carrie took me for a test ride on her local Gutierrez Canyon Loop. I was coughing a lot and easily winded, but I completed the ride and exercise felt familiar and good for my body. This morning, Carrie and I got up early to drive to Abiquiu, where I'd reconnect with the route. I stocked up on Gatorades and breakfast burritos at Bodie's General Store, said goodbye to Carrie, then headed out to climb the Polvadera Mesa. I climbed the foothills, crossed a meadow, then entered the Santa Fe State Forest. From there, I climbed into a forest of tall pine trees, later mixed with aspens. I biked along edges of mesas, crossed a little valley, then climbed some more. In places, the road became very washed out with deep ruts, sandy patches, and clumps of rocks. I carefully picked my lines as I climbed. The miles ticked down incredibly slowly until I finally reached a place to wild camp for the night. Leaving Abihu, climbing into Polvadera Mesa. Big day. I couldn't breathe well, especially as I got to higher elevations, so I needed to take breaks after any big effort. At one point, I saw a break in the trees at the right and figured there must be a good view. There was! I walked a short distance off the road to a gorgeous overlook of a canyon below and colorful mesa walls. I sat on a rock and enjoyed the view for a while. At one point, I was climbing a hill and I heard, Go! 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 You can do it! 
I turned around to see who was shouting, and it was Kenny, the Australian bike packer whom I'd met in Montana. He waited for me at the top of the hill and we chatted. We'd both heard that pro cyclist Lachlan Morton was just behind us and fantasized that he'd have a crew carrying water with him. When we finally spotted Lachlan, there was no crew, but he did pose for a photo. Kenny and I rode a little further until I spotted an informal campsite at right about the mileage I had planned. I made a call to stop and Kenny did too. It was already 6.30 p.m. and I was exhausted. This morning, I woke up very thirsty and was coughing up a lot of crud. Kenny broke camp quicker than me, so I told him not to wait. From the moment I started riding, I didn't feel well. Small efforts made me cough and wheeze. I knew I had to take it slow. I kept pedaling as much as I could, taking short breaks in the shade. Today's route had frequent ups and downs, but my psyche stayed consistently low. I'd spent most of the day and all of the night without cell service, and being sick and isolated was taking a severe toll on me. Trying to do this when I was healthy was hard. Trying to do this when I was sick, exhausted, dehydrated, and undernourished was a recipe for disaster. Well, last night I called Tony and asked him to come and get me. He asked me if I was sure, and I said yes. I was sick. I wasn't having any fun, and I felt like I'd done enough. I was ready to go home. He said he'd leave within a couple of hours, and it would take him two days to drive down to get me. Two more days. I could do that, I thought. I'll keep riding and meet him in Grants, New Mexico. So today I would ride to the Chaco Trade Center in Pueblo Pintado. I had so many emotions as I packed up my bike and got ready to roll out this morning. Relief, guilt, regret. I'd called my parents and told them I was ending in grants. Despite all of their enthusiastic dot watching, they applauded my decision. It's not worth hurting your health, they said. This is your trip, they reiterated. We're so proud of you. It's been a great adventure to follow, they assured me. We can't wait to see you. Leaving Cuba. The ride was really pretty today. It reminded me of Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Wide open spaces punctuated with striped hills, mesas, and canyons. When I looked back, I could see the wooded Pelvedera Mesa I had descended the day before. The roads were relatively flat at first, but became rolling. The tarmac made the riding faster and more manageable. I was actually enjoying the ride. Was it becoming easier? Or was it just because I knew it would be over soon? By 1 p.m., I arrived at the Chaco Trade Center. A man came up to me right away and asked if I were riding the divide. I said yes, and he showed me to where I could put up my tent. There was a sandbox tent base built next to a shipping container they were using for storage. He told me I was free to get water from the bathrooms and said I could hang out in the laundromat to escape the heat of the day. I was so grateful. I'd had time to think while I was dawdling the day away. I would have just six more days of riding left after Grant's. Couldn't I do just six more days? But Tony was already on his way down. I called Tony to float the idea past him. He didn't hesitate. If I wanted to finish, he would support me. For the first time in a long while, I was excited again about my trip. It took almost giving it up to realize how much it meant to me to complete this journey. I woke up a little before 6 a.m. It had rained on and off last night, but everything was still pretty dry. I got my tent packed while I heard the gates open. I was relieved to be able to go into the store and use the bathroom. I had beautiful weather riding off from Pueblo Pintado, overcast and cool. 
I rode through gorgeous canyons and by colorful mesas. As is typical for a day on the divide, I encountered plenty of ups and downs, but the grades weren't too bad. After the last climb, I looked at my bike computer. I was about to have 30 miles of downhill. I found myself in Grants in just one and a half hours. The skies opened up to rain as I arrived, but I didn't care. I took a photo by the Grants Route 66 sign. A few miles later, there was Tony. We planned our next steps over pizza in the motel room. He decided he'd work from a hotel room in Silver City while I was riding the Gila. He'd stay tomorrow night at the toaster house in Python with me. I set foot outside the motel this morning with my fully packed bike, all ready to take off, when a bunch of motorcycle dudes asked me, you going south? I told them yes. Well, it rained all last night and it's raining today. Huh, I said. I guess I'll have to put on my rain gear. I didn't have much of a choice but to ride in the rain. You're a gutsy gal, the motorcycle dude told me. I took it as a compliment. Because of the rain, I chose the paved route through the Almalpai Monument. I started out to Grants into a headwind and thought, oh boy, is this how today is going to go? But once I hit the road that goes by the monument, the cliffs blocked most of the wind. Eventually the cliffs fell away and the road was again surrounded by high plains desert. I took a gamble on the dirt road ACA route for the last part of the ride to Pie Town. In the last 10 miles, I heard a thunder boom and rain dumped from the sky. The road became a slick and muddy ice rink with stick to your tires mud. Tony arrived just at that moment. I threw my bike on his car. Then we navigated the slip and slide conditions, the final miles to Pie Town. Bye. That's a girl with some drugs. Yeah. <laughs> See you, Pie Town. And grants. I genuinely enjoyed the ride along the monument. There were black lava flows on the right side of the road and beautiful sandstone formations on the other. And the flowers! There were so many new ones that I hadn't seen on the trip so far. Lots of purples and yellows. I stopped to visit the arch. It was the second time that I've been to this roadside attraction. This time, I took the paved path all the way to the end to get a good view of it. I was enamored with the yellow flowers crowning the staghorn cactus along the path. I saw a lone dog up ahead. When I reached it, it had its tail between its legs. But as I spoke nice to him, he came up to me. He had an orange collar on, but no tag. I could only guess that he lived around here somewhere. But he was far from any buildings I'd passed. I gave him half a bagel with cream cheese, which he devoured in an instant. I'd have given him more, but I didn't have food to spare. I gave him some final pats, then rode on. He didn't follow me. 
You okay? Yeah? You okay? Yeah. I don't have anything else I can give you. <clears throat> You're a good boy. You gonna be okay? You gonna be okay? Okay. You should go home, huh? Go home. Bye. Everything in Pie Town was closed, so we made dinner from the donated pantry items in the toaster house. Kenny was there, as were Linda and Ronnie from Indiana Pass Day. We all pored over maps and weather conditions, deciding how we might safely traverse the Gila in the next few days. I created an alternate route around the Gila to avoid the rain in the forecast and the threat of death mud. The route isn't shorter, it's just paved, and will take three days of riding. I got a late start, but was the first one to leave Toaster House. Around 11 a.m., I stopped at a cafe and had a green chili burrito. After lunch, the real work began, a faux flat climb that went on and on, eventually ascending back into the tree line and pines rose all around me. The descent cut through rock walls, then followed a tiny river. I stopped in Apache for snacks, and when I got on my bike again, I heard a boom. The storm clouds had descended the mountain with me. I quickly pulled on my raincoat and pedaled hard to reserve to get out of the rain. Excuse me, leaving Kimoto, which is after Pie Town. Heading the reserve, 53 miles. Oh boy. The Apache General Store had a sleepy, handsome young Siamese cat lounged across the counter. I was overjoyed to give it some ear and chin scratches while I paid up. I dined in my motel room, cooking my camp meal of risotto for dinner and chasing it with a leftover bagel and a Justin's hazelnut spread packet that I carried with me all the way since Canada. Climbing up and out of reserve just kept revealing more views until I finally descended into lush valleys and even slowly flowing muddy rivers. I stopped in Alma for a mango ice cream bar and chocolate milk, then continued for 30 more miles. Eventually the climbs became more descending for a while. A crack of thunder rang out and rain started. I learned to get my rain gear out immediately and soon enough it was pouring. Dried creek beds came back to life Birds flocked and chirped their approval. Flowers drooped and eventually I felt the sun again on my back as the rain continued to splatter my front. I looked, but no rainbows appeared. I phoned Tony and asked him to meet me at Chuck's Folly Sea Store in Cliff. 
He had mentioned that Carl was staying in Silver City and would like to see me once more before he finishes his ride. With the rain and few camping options around, I agreed to stay with Tony in Silver City. He'd return me to Chuck's Folly in the morning to continue my ride. Choosing my own route these last few days has been empowering. I don't like, and am not experienced with, being so isolated and without access to water, and I fear the weather. When I released myself from the ACA route and chose my own path, I enjoyed it so much more. Every discovery became my discovery, my choice. A difficult hill? My hill. I've removed the unseen forces that are deciding my destiny, and it's my route. It matters to me. Then of the fourth to last day. While I was riding yesterday, Tony had helped Carl recover his camping gear that he'd had to abandon when he'd become stuck in death mud in the Gila. It was quite a story, but it's Carl's to tell. It was great to see Carl one last time and swap stories with him about our adventures in New Mexico. After breakfast, Tony dropped me back in Cliff to pick up where I left off. The road was hilly, but I thought, eh, I've done this before. I was in Silver City in no time. My route took me directly in front of Tony's hotel, so he came down and met me for lunch at a taco stand. Fueled for the last miles, I paddled up and down numerous more long hills with reasonable grades. <laughs> One last ticket before it's gone One last summer before it's fall Tune your strings and play your cards Lead the words, hit me like a game and you're beating, beating on my drum. And you're beating, beating on my door. Running faster, faster than my dreams. And I can't stop. I got an early start this morning, and soon I caught some riders I had never met before, Catherine and Max. I didn't talk much to Max, but rode with Catherine for a few miles. She's from Bozeman and is also a solo female divide rider. She had friends join her from time to time too, and started riding with Max in Montana, where they first met. What's funny is that people going northbound kept asking her, have you met Katrina yet? <laughs> she said whoever she talked to, said I was really cruising, funny. So we finally met on her last day and my second to last. 
After I pulled ahead of Catherine and Max, I saw my first road runner. It started to dart into the road in front of me, then it reversed course, ducking behind a bush. I was so excited. When I reached I-70, I stopped at the Continental Divide trading post. It wasn't selling gas anymore. Cars were parked sideways in front where the pumps would have been. As I shopped for snacks, my eyes swept over this large gift shop with a tiny section of food and drinks and I couldn't help but wonder how much longer it would be here. There are more modern gas stations up the highway, but to us cyclists, this is a nice place to stop and take a break and to get something to drink. After the shop, I had a stretch of washboard frontage road directly into a headwind. Normally this would frustrate or discourage me, but today I knew I had pavement coming. Just 30 more miles today and just one more ride after that. It makes all the difference in what I'm willing to tolerate. On the way to Hachita. Lovely washboard road. Tony picked me up in Hachita and we drove nearly an hour to our motel in Demi. Tomorrow morning, he'd return me to the Hachita Food Mart for my last day of riding. Today I'd finished the ride. I was excited to get started but equally wanted to soak it all in, make it last. I decided to forego listening to music or podcasts so I could be present. The first 10 miles went quickly. A distant mountain became close. The road turned slightly and I suddenly was coasting downhill. It opened to a valley and I began to notice water on both sides of the road from the recent rains. A jackrabbit hopped off to my right into the shrubs. I rode through a swamp-like area with water collected on the ground for hundreds of yards. Birds gathered in numbers, flitting about with apparent joy. A roadrunner darted up into a bush as I rode by. With 20 miles left, my aunt and uncle passed me in their Jeep. I pedaled faster, eager to get to the finish. Tony passed five minutes later. True to form, the last 10 miles were the hardest. The wind and slight incline made me work to get to the finish. This morning was gorgeous in the desert. Clouds were parting and reflecting the desert sunrise while mountain peaks, near and far, began to light up with the golden morning rays. Everything glistened from overnight rains. Early in my ride today, I marveled that here I was, a solo woman riding her bike in the desert with no one around. 
It hit me how special it was that I could do this and not feel any fear. Riding alone in remote places had become commonplace. Experiencing a remote landscape with very few other people is an addictive feeling. It's yours to explore with your eyes and your ears as you pedal. I want to embrace that feeling when I get home as well. Right there, in the middle of the road, King Havelina. There comes another one, right there, right there. Yes! Yes! You see it? You see it? Yes! Another one! finished, the bags came off my bike, my bike went on the rack, we climbed into the Jeep and headed to lunch. Text messages started chiming in on my mobile from family and friends. I might be headed back to normal life, but I would never be again the same person I was at the start oh. of the trip. I had discovered a me on the trip that was self-reliant, not afraid to be vulnerable, found joy in experiences over things, loved connecting with new people, possessed the ability to dig deep and could bounce back from adversity. Stay tuned for a gear video where I walk through what I brought on the trip, including what worked, what got lost, and what I'd replace. <laughs>